Hi, everybody, and welcome to this, the latest in our series of podcasts brought to you by the team here at Export to Japan. I get very excited about all the amazing guests that we're lucky to interview on these podcasts. But uh, for this particular one, I'm as excited, even more excited than I normally get, because we have a, a wonderful entrepreneur with us today who has built uh, and in, is in the process of building an amazing company. Um, and she's doing well with building a company on a global basis. But in particular, she's doing some really exciting stuff in Japan. And uh, I'm, I'm delighted to welcome Tajinda, Tajinda Banwait, to the podcast today so that we can learn more about her company and uh, her journey into Japan. So Tajinda, welcome to the Export to Japan podcast. Thanks, Steve. Really Really good to be here on here to talk about urban apothecary today. Yeah, brilliant. Good to have you on board. And I can already see behind you, actually, that incredible display that gives us a little bit of a sample of your, your products that you've developed and the, the packaging and the imagery around it. Um, and, you know, really excited to know more about that. So before we dive into talking specifically about Japan, could you just tell us a little bit more about your company and, and the background and what it is that you that you produce? Yeah, of course. So Urban Apothecary was founded in 2011 and it started off as a home fragrance brand. Um, very different to how it looks now. Um, we've evolved the brand over, over time, but it came about um, because I was looking for a candle for a friend and I couldn't find what I was looking for. Um, and back then, um, all, the, all the candles were very much straight sided, um, pretty much where we are now with the brand. Um, but at that point in time, I wanted something else. So I found an apothecary vessel and I sat at my kitchen table designing it and then pitched it to some buyers um, in the UK. And our very first customer was John Lewis. Um, well, today, we have candles, diffusers, bath and body products, and our products are sold in over 30 countries worldwide. That is super impressive. And what a great introduction. And my word, getting one of your first clients is John Lewis. That's, <laughs> that's pretty yeah. impressive going. So uh, so you mentioned that you launched the brand in, in, in 2011. And I think I know that prior to that, you've been in the fashion uh, and, and beauty product business and sector for quite a while. Is that right? Yeah. So I've been in the beauty industry for, for 27 years. Uh, wow. I know it doesn't look like it, but I, I have. Um, so I've been in the industry for a very, very long time, working with lots of luxury brands, um, I've also worked in the fashion sector as well, but my real passion is bath, body and fragrance. Um, so I knew I would almost come back to that. Um, mm. So I, I, I um, trademarked Urban Apothecary as a brand sort of 15 years ago with a view that I, I would use it for something one day, but I just didn't know what. Um, mm. So, yeah, it's a sector that I'm really excited about. And um, I've also been a distributor myself in, in the market. So I understand that model really well. Well, that's great. And that's definitely one of the things I want to come on to shortly and sort of pick your brains a little bit more and get your, your knowledge on that. Um, now, you mentioned you launched the brand in 2011. Um, so I guess you've just gone past your 10 year anniversary. Where was the point when you first started trading in Japan? When did that happen? So we started in 2015 originally, um, and it was with the old um, look of the brand. Um, so back then we looked very shabby chic. Um, really beautiful, pretty vessels. And the look was very much different, but we were approached at a trade show um, that I was at by a distributor in Japan and they wanted to take it forward into their market, which they did. Um, they actually didn't take Urban Apothecary, they took one of our sister brands, Urban Old Factory. And we started off in that market and it was a really interesting one. It was not something that we'd sort of set out to, to launch in, but we just found that there was demand for home fragrance types of products. Um, so that's how it started initially. And then we worked with that distributor until 2016. And then, um, then unfortunately, you know, things stopped with them, but literally straight afterwards, we were approached directly by another distributor in Japan um, who'd seen our products there. But that sort of coincided with us doing a rebrand for Urban Apothecary. So the new look that you see behind me is very much modern, sleek. Um, the, the fragrances are, are quite broad. We've got 17 fragrances across 200 products now. Um, wow. So it was a case of um, launching this new look in Japan, which was something that we really felt would resonate with the consumer there. Mm, okay, okay. Plenty of bits that I want to unpick immediately with, with everything you've just shared there. So thank you for that. Um, and, 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 
a few of these questions I want to explore with you. I'm, I'm sort of thinking about it from the point of view of our listeners, which is, you know, other international companies that are looking to, to go into the market and follow the journey that you've done. So I know the kind of questions they'll have. I know what they'll be thinking. And, and you're a great person to explore this more with. So the first thing was you mentioned that that first distributor that you met at a trade show and they approached you at a trade show. Just out of interest, where was that trade show? Was it in Japan or was it in Europe or where was that? No, no, it was it was actually in Birmingham. It was one of the wow. it was it was, a, it was a British show. It was the it was the Spring Fair show. Oh yes, and, okay. Um, you know, the show ha, ha, was phenomenal back then for for introducing you to international um, distributors and buyers. Um, and it was and it, all it takes is one approach, and and you know, mm. there's it started it started the ball rolling, and mm. we were happy to ex explore it, even though there was no real strategy in place. Um, to mm. launch in Japan at that time. That, and again, that, that's kind of my second question I was coming on to, because, you know, all, all of us as entrepreneurs, we have our strategic plans and we have our roadmaps and we have our goals and our ambitions of how we're going to drive our company. But what you're literally saying is there wasn't necessarily a strategy that you were thinking at that time to enter Japan. But the trigger point was being at that trade show in Birmingham and a representative from this Japanese distributor coming to your stand and opening up the discussion with you, right? Yeah, I mean, I think my outlook on it has slightly changed a little bit from that first experience. Mm -hmm. um, so that first distribution didn't work out. And I think what, mm -hmm. what I learned about that process was is that the product really needs to be right in your home market first. And mm -hmm. when we rebranded, we made a point of not launching with any new distributors until we were entirely happy with the way that the brand was in our own in our own market because actually you you get to um, sort out any niggling issues um, with packaging etc and and there'll always be something along the way but we wanted to make sure that it was perfect in our own market before we rolled out and that's what we did really with our second Japanese distributor we were talking for about a year and a half so it was a really long courtship wow. really wow 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 yeah, again, so many interesting points here. And I think you mentioned that the second distributor that you you, you worked with. And but is that are you still with that distributor or has your strategy yeah. moved on? But okay. So no, that no, distributor. Really. Okay, great. Well, again, I want to sort of learn more about that. But um just to take it one step at a time. So that second distributor, they also approached you. They 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 yeah. they found you. Yeah, okay. Really, really interesting. All right. Now you've started sharing some insights there, and you also mentioned, and I, I know from your, your previous life before you started this company, you you had experience of distributors and working with distributors. You, there's two experiences there. The first one you worked with that approached you, and then the second one that then approached you that you're still currently working with. What thoughts or tips, you know, could you share with our audience? And what 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 experience did you have about the important things to think about, the processes you went through when you were having that 18 month courtship or whatever it was, you know, when you're working out, is this the right distributor for us? What, what, what are some of the key tips you can share? Um, I think that um, it was all about relationship building. Uh, in those early days, I didn't know that it would take me as long to build up that relationship. But we very much um, work in the same way in the UK. We only work with people that we like and you only get to like people over time. So I think for us, yes, it was a slow process. And I know that a lot of businesses can get frustrated with doing business in Japan because of this, um, mm. because it can be a slow process, but actually it put us in really good stead so that actually when we were ready to go, we, 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 we'd already had a really good foundation. And when we were ready to go, I brought on board um, a friend who was actually a distributor to almost act as the bridge between us um, oh. because it, it, it just helped them and it helped me. Um, so they were a distributor, but they also understood the Japanese market really, really well. And I think that worked really well for us. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. So again, so many great takeaways and great experiences to, that you're sharing here. This whole point of being patient and not rushing is, 
is a very common theme for the Japanese market, having that longer term view of making the right decisions and getting things right. Um, but it's, it, as you say, it can be a tough one. You know, we, you, you've done a great job of building your company and, you know, budgets are tight and it, we're all under pressure to get sales flowing and things. So, so that balance point of having the right amount of patience and getting it right versus the temptation to start pushing to get revenue flowing is, is not always an easy one for entrepreneurs to, to think about, is it? So, but, oh, but yeah. kind of, you know, great advice you were, you were sort of sharing there. And then secondly, I sort of picked up a little bit. You were saying that the, the, the long courtship, as we've referred to it, that was really a two-way thing. It wasn't just the Japanese company taking time. You were happy on your side as well to take time to, to, to evaluate them, right? Yeah, and I think, you know, even if in, in, when you're hiring people for your own business, you tend to hire slowly to make sure you've got the right mm, fit. Mm. And, and I think, you know, that was something that was really important to us. We don't see our distributors as customers. We see them as partners. And I think that, yeah. that when you look at it like that, then you want somebody to come into your family in the same way and support your business as you grow. So that, mm. that's, that was really important to us as a business. Mm. Okay, really, again, great advice you're sharing. Okay, if we, if we take it forward a little bit now, so once you'd got to the point with this, this distributor that you're, you're currently working with, once you'd got to that point, where both sides were feeling comfortable. And, and, you know, another great tip you shared with us about feeling comfortable and liking the people you work with. I think that's another very valuable golden nugget. But once you got to that point of feeling good about all of that, could you share with us a little bit more about what the sort of plan or the strategy was or, or what then happened? What did that distributor do to start helping you penetrate the Japanese market? So, so the distributor that contacted us um, originally, um, we had that relationship, it was a year and a half going, but what we learned in that process was is that they had fantastic relationships in our category. And I think, you know, when we're looking for distributors, that is the aim, to find somebody that's really knowledgeable about your product category, understands the legislative elements of it and what's required um, for, the, for those buyers. And, and buyers in different categories want different things, but they understood that market really well. They distributed other home fragrance brands so that was another tick for us that they they understood um, those categories so I think that was really key we knew that they would do a great job we just needed them to work with us in the way that we wanted to work with them yes got it okay so that that sort of experience and channel and network and knowledge yeah. and contacts that was all the kind of valuable parts from your perspective that they could then put, put in, into practice yeah okay. yes absolutely yeah did you, as part of that process and as part of the ongoing process, you, you mentioned the kind of rebrands that you've gone through as you've developed your brand and your imagery. Um, was there anything in particular that you learnt in relation to the Japanese market, either from the customers or from the distributors that, that, that encouraged you to make changes or anything you had to think about? Yeah, I'm, I'm smiling about this, Steve, because um, I like to think that I um, pay attention to detail that's one of my strengths or weaknesses, however you want to look at it. Um, but I found that that was almost elevated with Japan. Um, oh, right. whilst I, so, so I see why you're smiling I, now. <laughs> so by that, I mean that they really look at attention to detail. And I love that. And I think that we had a lot of learnings off the back of that. Um, so, so one of the early ones, I would say is when um, we created our diffuser that you can see behind me and it was uh, a lovely diffuser bottle as you can see and the box we made it slightly bigger just to give it a bit more you know prominence on the shelf oh. and um, our distributor really didn't like that and they basically thought it was a a waste of space and b it just took up too much space on the shelf so we made some packaging specifically for the Japanese market, which is the box that you see on the shelf now, which has rolled out to all countries. And it is, um, you know, it, it, it holds our diffuser really snug and it's not seen as a waste and it's not, you know, it's not taking up too much space. So um, that was one of the early learnings um, with attention to detail. And one of the second ones, which happened um, actually only last year. So we're con constantly learning new things um, that we have black rattan reeds in our bottles and all of our diffusers have these reeds. 
but we decided to make a change um, and, and a positive change to a fibre reed. And the difference is, is that latin is natural wood material and, and the fibre is, is more synthetic. However, they're straighter. So from aesthetic point of view, we felt that it was the right thing to do. Um, however, our distributor didn't really see it like that. Um, they felt that somebody finding something different in their package to what was on the shelf or what they'd previously bought would be a bit of a challenge for them and that they would receive complaints. So the way that we resolved that was to actually supply them with both sets of reads initially until they sold through all of the older ones. Um, okay. So again, just that attention to detail and we love it. You know, we love that kind of feedback and, and it's all about perfecting the product. Yeah. That, again, these are such great examples you, you're giving us. And it's definitely a, a, a common theme that we find for companies that work out how to succeed in Japan, as you've done. One of the common ingredients is listening and being prepared to adapt and, and not, not trying to impose and push and, and being sensitive. And, and, and I guess, you know, creating the right relationship with your partner or your distributor um, so that they feel comfortable to give you that feedback and share their thoughts with you so that you can learn. So all, all credit to you that you've, you've not only facilitated that environment to get that feedback, but you also act on it as well and work out the, the, the solutions for it. So, uh, so that's mighty impressive, yeah. And again, just so that we can understand and, and sort of share your, your experience. So how does your sort of trading relationship work now? Does your, your, your partner in the Japanese market, are they basically your importer and they're holding stock locally in Japan? Or do you ship directly from the UK? Or how, how does that work? Um, so initially, the, the, the relationship started almost because um, we work with the Conrad shop in the UK and they have um, uh, stores in, in Japan and we've had huge success with them in the UK. So we really needed a partner on the ground to support them. And we really felt that the best way to service them was for a distributor to buy stock from us and hold it in the market so that they could service them. Um, that relationship you know, started um, with, with the Conrad shop initially when we started those conversations with our second distributor. And they've only actually come to fruition. We only launched with the Conrad shop last year. Um, wow. So it's really interesting how, you know, it's sort of gone full circle and it's taken time to get there. But nice. um, yeah, that's how it really came about. So they, they hold stock and yeah. then they can react to stores and, and their demands um, yeah. quite quickly. Yeah, really good. That makes that makes common sense. And again, it sounds like a good, good uh, model that you've evolved there step by step in that in that relationship. OK, what would you the next question I have for you is. It. it you, you've done a great job and you're clearly you know, successful in Japan and, and your enthusiasm for how, you, how you've become successful comes across in, in your answers and the discussion. It's really great. But of course, you know, it's not always a rosy picture. And, and for example, you did mention that you've changed distributor one time from the initial one that you worked with. What would you say, again, to our audience of companies that are thinking about Japan and, and other companies like where you were in 2011 or 2015, 2016, when you first ventured into Japan, what would you say have been some of the biggest challenges for you? And what, what kind of things would you share with other UK companies that are thinking about the Japanese market as words of caution or ways they should yeah. prepare themselves? Um, I'd say that researching the market and your category within that market is really important. Um, I think for anybody going into the market, they need to understand the legislative elements um, for, for certain product categories, um, but also understanding how the consumer will potentially buy your product or service. Um, so the Japanese consumer have different preferences re with regards to scents, for example. Um, mm. so, so that's something that we've had to learn and adapt to, um, but also as a business, the Japanese um, prefer to buy diffusers rather than candles which is um, quite opposite to, to most of our other markets. So mm. again, just learning what will work in one market versus others. Um, so really understanding it. But I think the key is really building those relationships early doors. And also, you know, working with Japan, is it, it can be quite different. And somebody that you meet on day one might not be the person that actually you end up working with on a day-to-day -day basis. So there very much is that hierarchy and I think it's understanding that and then respecting that and understanding who you will be working with and, and that there will be several tiers to decision making. So the process can sometimes be quite slow. 
Um, but you have to go through the process to get there at the end. Mm, okay, yeah. And, and sort of link, link to that point to gender. How how's the last couple of years and, and the whole pandemic and what's gone on, how, how has that impacted? You know, you, a very strong message comes across from you about being patient, developing the right relationships, getting to know people. Um, but none of us have been able to get on airplanes and travel to these international markets. So what, what has that meant for you and the way you do business over the last couple of years? So over the last couple of years, we've been having more Zoom and Teams calls. I think mm. that's every, the way that everybody's been working. I actually haven't been to Japan um, prior to prior to that, um, but I'd love to go this year um, if we can make it out. But I definitely think the face-to-face -face, um, is, is really valuable um, in, in doing business with different countries. And we do have, you know, we do have regular catch-ups and correspondence. Um, the... the the lockdowns were, were challenging for a lot of markets. And I think that as a brand, we fared quite well. Um, we were one of the fortunate ones and um, our business has grown during COVID and after COVID. Um, so we've seen some phenomenal growth in those markets. Really interesting, huh? yeah. And, and, you, and you're so right, you know, traditionally Japan has always been one of those markets where you need to go out there, you need to meet people. All the points you made are very well about developing relationships, but here we are in this current climate that's been imposed on us all. You're a great example of a company that's been able to do it, build those relationships, grow the revenue and grow the business without actually being able to go and meet the, the, the partners out there and have a look at the market. And, uh, and it, it's another great example that it can be done with when you do the right things and, and and those right things are coming out from as a theme from from your information you're sharing with us so that's super impressive okay sort of bringing it to a little bit of a conclusion then what about the next steps looking ahead you know do you have any thoughts about where the, the, the Japanese market could go for you is it is it a priority do you have any particular plans in Japan what does what does the landscape look like ahead for you yeah, so I think, you know, we've, we've got those really great foundations in place now and the business has been growing year on year with Japan and, and it's really keep going with it. Um, you know, we're in some of the best stockists there are in Japan um, in terms of department stores and, and independent stockists. And with the launch of the Cotton Ram shop in Japan as well, that's been really successful. So I think for us, it's continue to build those relationships. I mean, I don't think you will see us in thousands of stockists in any one market we really want to be um you know quite niche in that respect but that means also building our relationship with those retailers you know we're not in it for a year we're in it for five ten years you know we want to build the business with them and i think that's really important yeah that's that's again really great advice and I have to say, you know, hearing your journey and 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 thinking back to when you started the company in, in 2011, it must be wonderful when you can get back to traveling, hopefully sometime later yeah. this year, for you to be able to go to those department stores in Japan and see your products on the shelf and see consumers buying it. What a buzz that must be, I think. Oh, yeah, it will be fantastic. I, I really look forward to it. Yeah, I bet, I bet. Well, Tajinda, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I was so looking forward to this discussion and I'm, I have to say I'm super impressed with, with what you've done. As you know, through the work we do at Export to Japan, we get to talk with a lot of UK companies and advise a lot of UK companies on their journey into Japan. And when you come across somebody that has done it and done it so well and has done things so correctly, um, it's an absolute pleasure and, and an honor to, uh, to chat and hear your story. And thank you so much for taking time out today to, to share your story. And I'm sure many UK companies will be able to benefit from, from the wisdoms you've shared with us today. So thank you for that. No, thank you, Steve. Thanks for having me on. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you for your time today and, and good luck with the ongoing business. I, I can't wait to keep in touch and see how your business grows in Japan. I'm sure it will continue to. So thank you for your time today, Tajinda. And uh, to everybody listening in, I, I hope you've enjoyed that podcast. I think that was a great discussion that we had with Tajinda. So impressive to see what she's been able to do with her company and her brand. And uh, you can see she's definitely one of these companies that I would say respectfully to her, she's punching well above her weight. It's incredible what she's achieved in Japan to get into some of the big department stores, the way she's done and the way she's managed that journey and that, that relationship. And uh, I think some of the golden nuggets that she's shared with us today, hopefully will be very valuable for many more companies to, uh, to follow um, in, in her footsteps. So thank you all for listening in. Hope it's been valuable. Uh, thank you again to Jinda and, uh, We'll catch up with you all very soon on the next podcast. Thank you. Bye now.